I've often been accused of being a Jesuit. So let me reinforce that. I'd like the PA team to play an item of music. It's, uh, some of you will be familiar with it. It's Ave Maria. I thought somebody would say amen. Clearly in the wrong audience. Just, just close your eyes and be blessed. reflect what you heard. What did you hear? I'll come back to that. In an attempt to live a little longer, my wife Jennifer and I try to incorporate walking into our daily habits and the irony was not lost on us but a preferred route that we would take from our from door to door, a circular route, would end up going through a cemetery. Because irrespective of whatever you do, we're all gonna end up there. And the interesting thing about cemeteries is that they give a summation of a life on the headstone, four or five key facts. The person's name, their dates of birth and death. There will be some familial aspect, that is to say a loving husband or a caring mother, things like that. There may be something in the headstone that would Describe what they meant to others, eternally loved. And it's sobering to think that for the majority of us, posterity will have us remembered by four, maybe five facts on a headstone. You may live to 90 years as a good Adventist, and then all you are remembered for is about 25 to 40 words. In the scriptures, in the scripture reading that we just had, the character of Abedmelech is one of those minor characters. You read a book, you read through Jeremiah, he's there, he's gone, he's not important. And yet, he won't be the kind of person when we get to glory, everybody's rushing, of course, to be with Jesus and to be with Daniel and all of these great heroes. But permit me to suggest Abedmelech may be worth searching out to. We know a few things about him, four or five facts. We know his name, Abedmelech. It means from the Hebrew servant of the king. We know his nationality and likely ethnicity. On the version that was read this morning or this afternoon, he was described as a Cushite or an Ethiopian. He was in all likelihood a black of black African descent. By implication, Judah was not his native home. 
He might have been described as an immigrant in Judah. In current parlance, in British parlance, Brexit parlance, we might describe him as a refugee. We know what he would, did by way of his profession. He was, an, he, he was an officer, an official in the royal court, so he had clearly done quite well for himself. But there is also something, in depending on the Bible on your holy device that you have, there is also something else that he's described as, and that was he was a eunuch. Going back to Ave Maria, what did you hear? Did you hear that Ian Sweeney is genuinely one of the infiltrators from Rome within the Adventist church? Did you hear a young child singing, a female? I wonder what you heard. The song is actually a recording of, by Alessandro Morissetti. And he recorded this song when he was 50 years of age a male, and it is one of the few recordings that we have of a castrato. Now, children, you can ask your parents or guardians over lunch what all of these words mean. It will make for an interesting conversation. Abedmelech, as a eunuch, might well have been castrated as a baby or, as did happen as an adult, as a slave, as a prisoner of war. If he was castrated either as a baby or as an adult, it still isn't nice. Being castrated, if as a child, of course, he could not have had children. In his death, his lineage would end, assuming he was castrated before he had any children. But Abedmelech's life is so much more than these few facts that we know of him. I would suggest to us this afternoon that in his life, we find a great deal of inspiration and understanding. And, and it's a life that revealed hope and trust in God. And Abedmelech is such a wonderful guy. He's, permit me to make the case why we should look for him in glory. When we're introduced to Abedmelech, Judah, its capital city, Jerusalem, was on the brink of destruction. For decades, Jeremiah had been preaching a message that the people needed to abandon the worship of false gods and that they needed to turn to Jehovah God. Jeremiah warned the people over that the nation, his nation was facing destruction at the hands of the Babylonians. He said armies would just devastate Judah. Now I've had people sleep through my sermons. I'm quite used to it. I think it's quite a public act on my part. But I've never been physically attacked because of my preaching. Jeremiah was arrested because of his preaching. Oh, he had at times kings ignore him. He had religious leaders mock him. People were indifferent to his preaching. But what Jeremiah experienced just for the spoken word was quite incredible. He was physically beaten. He was tortured at times. And in this story, when we meet it, he was imprisoned. And by the time we reach chapters 38 and 39 of the book of Jeremiah, he was an old man and ministry had exacted a heavy toll on his life. He was largely alone. God had forbidden him from ever getting married or having children. You see that in chapter 16. And at times, ministry for Jeremiah was exceptionally lonely. As the Babylonian armies approached Jerusalem, Jeremiah told the people that they were not to resist the incoming army. He said, you're to take your white handkerchief, wave it in surrender, leave the city and surrender to the Babylonians. That's what God told him to tell the people. But the message was 
regard it as treason and for his pains, Jeremiah was, was taken by his enemies, placed in a disused well where he was to die from either starvation, hypothermia, or disease. And it's at this juncture, when Jeremiah is physically, literally, and I would suggest spiritually at his lowest, a slave, a eunuch, an immigrant, a refugee makes a significant and a powerful intervention into the life of the suffering prophet. And so Jeremiah 38 verse 7 and onwards tells us that Abedmelech heard about the plight of Jeremiah and took his concerns to the king. And said to him, my lord the king, these men have acted wickedly in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet. Possibly, we don't know. Possibly if Abedmelech had been made a eunuch as a child, he would have been a castrato when he spoke to the king. That being the case, he would not have sounded like the English actor Brian Blessed with that booming bass tenor voice stating, my lord the king, these men have acted wickedly in all that they have done. As a castrada, he may have sounded more like, my lord the king, these men have acted wickedly in all that they have done. Now you laugh or smile, but if he was a castrado from childhood, I could imagine that for poor Abedmelech, as he grew up into adulthood, he would have had to go through life with sniggers and laughs when he opened his mouth and spoke. Abedmelech might have been mocked for the lack of his manhood. And yet this story tells us that this man who might possibly have been looked down upon had the courage to approach the king and at risk to his own safety, he spoke up and on the behalf and favorably for Jeremiah. His eunuch status was no greater than his manly courage. You see, courage is an absence of fear. Courage is daring and doing and acting without regard for personal safety or consequence. It's not being reckless, it's being courageous. We might have looked, listened to Abed, Abedmelech and might have said, he's not really a real man. But he was all man because he exhibited a courage other men lacked. Abedmelech was bold enough to speak on the behalf of Jeremiah, even though the men that had imprisoned Jeremiah were men of great power and influence. Abedmelech had the boldness to speak the truth about wickedness in his workplace, even though he was a slave or a refugee or an outsider or an immigrant, a heathen, a nobody. He stood up where nobody else stood up. He had the courage to speak, even though he knew there might be serious repercussions to him. Abedmelech's high-pitched words and intervention was a rebuke to the people of God who rejected God's messenger. He stood out from the people of Judah, not because he was a Cushite, possessed a castrado voice. He stood out because he was prepared to stand up for God and God's prophet. And Abedmelech's words won the favor of the king. The king ordered him to take 30 men and lift Jeremiah out of the disused well. I don't know why it would require 30 men. I don't think Jeremiah was that heavy. But maybe this, the mire that he was in was extremely tough. And I believe that like Abedmelech, we should ask the Lord 
to give us the courage as well as the diplomatic skill, tact, and statesmanship to approach those in high places to address the spiritual state of our nation, of our community, and speak out and against the inequality and injustice performed against vulnerable people in our society. Some of our Adventism, which we didn't get from Jeremiah, is only about so long as I'm safe and saved, it's okay. Abedmelech teaches us we need to look out for the vulnerable and the oppressed. But not only did Abedmelech show himself to be a courageous, a courageous man, he also showed himself to be an a compassionate intercessor. So notice what he does in verse 11 of chapter 38. So Abedmelech took the men with him, went to a room under the treasury in the palace. He took some old rags, worn out clothes from there, let them down with ropes to Jeremiah in the cistern. Abedmelech the Cushite said to Jeremiah, maybe, I can't do the high-pitched voice anymore, but put these old rags and worn out clothes under your arms to pad the ropes. Jeremiah did so, and they pulled him up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern, and Jeremiah remained in the courtyard of the guard. Abedmelech showed himself to be a godly, compassionate intercessor. He was willing to articulate the needs of Jeremiah when Jeremiah could not speak for himself. We should ask the Lord to help us to pray, to intercede for others when they are unable to do so for themselves. Abedmelech's actions reveal that there is no such thing as an insignificant intercession or service to those who are in need. And I believe that God had this act of history recorded so billions could follow the example of this one obscure person in the Bible. You see, little acts of service become much more when we place them in the hands of God. Abedmelech pulled Jeremiah out of the pit when Jeremiah needed help them the most. And I believe that there are times in life when we all need others to lift us up out of a pit. Jeremiah's ministry, I believe, clearly had influenced Abedmelech enough to inspire him to do something for the man of God. Even though it may have appeared to Jeremiah that no one was listening, the people of Judah didn't listen, the religious leaders didn't listen, the kings didn't listen, there was a refugee, an immigrant, a eunuch who was listening. And Abedmelech's actions also show us that there is no insignificant person with God. Oh, I know, we watch the news and... And, and it just, it's just the way it, it is with us. Somebody dies, one person dies near to home, it's on our radar. A thousand people die in Syria. Eh. But with God, every soul, every person is significant to God. And Abedmelech saw the insignificant Jeremiah, tried for treason, no one speaking out for him, but Abedmelech, like God, realized that there was a significant person who required an intervention. And what Abedmelech was, he was more than just mouth and a high-pitched voice. He had actions behind his words. And his words opened the door for ministry opportunities. You see, there are times when words alone do not convey the love of God as much as a simple act of kindness. Telling somebody they're hungry, as James said, God bless you and be well fed, is not as significant as giving the person a sandwich. And so as the passage tells us, Abedmelech went, got some ropes, 
Rags and rope instructed Jeremiah to put the rags under his arms so that he would not be hurt when he was pulled to safety. You see here, Abedmelech tells us that when you have compassion for others, you cannot, you cannot continue living your life as if nothing is wrong when a person is at the bottom of a well. Abedmelech, he was an extraordinary encourager. It was a Christian author, William Barclay, who wrote, one of the highest of human duties is the duty of encouragement. It is easy to laugh at men's ideals. It is easy to pour cold water on their enthusiasm. It is easy to discourage others. The world is full of discouragers. We have a Christian duty to encourage one another. Many a time a word of praise or thanks or appreciation or cheer has kept a man on his feet. Blessed is the man who speaks such a word. I kind of wonder if William Barclay has hung out with Adventists because I've met some of those discouragers I've sat on church boards nothing can be done nothing is worth you know today oh it's too hot the sun is shining it's too warm they can never lift you up but please understand, the gift of discouragement is not a gift from God. Making everyone look as miserable as you is not a gift of the Spirit. Encourage someone. Abedmelech was a man of encouragement to Jeremiah who needed encouragement. And Abedmelech was committed to doing the right thing and he served to encourage the elderly prophet, Jeremiah. I love Abedmelech because he was not prepared to turn a blind eye to injustice or bullying or the evil actions of others. By standing up for Jeremiah and encouraging him, Abedmelech was standing up for God. You know, the Bible never condoned the practice of making eunuchs. Scholars argue, well, was he a eunuch or wasn't he? But this much we know, there were eunuchs, castra castratos, that are spoken of in the scriptures. As a matter of fact, the Bible, as I've said, never condoned the practice of making eunuchs through castration. It is an abhorrent act. In fact, in the Mosaic law, you read in Deuteronomy chapter 23, it excluded castratos from the congregation as they met to worship in the tabernacle. And this prohibition emphasized God's abhorrence of this mutilation of the human body. But despite how lowly Abedmelech might have been regarded by men, he certainly was highly regarded by God. For his story doesn't end in chapter 38, it continues into chapter 39. And in verse 15, we read the following, chapter 39. While Jeremiah had been confined in the courtyard of the guard, the word of the Lord came to him. Go, verse 16, and tell Abedmelech the Cushite, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, I am about to fulfill my words against this city, words concerning disaster, not prosperity. At, thy, at that time, they will be fulfilled before your eyes. But watch this, verse 17, a promise of God to the refugee, but I will rescue you on that day, declares the Lord. You will not be given into the hands of those you fear. I will save you. You will not fall by the sword, but you will escape with your life because you trust in me, declares the Lord. Hallelujah. When the people of Judah, God's people, the remnant, were largely destroyed and lost in the invasion by the Babylonians, God saved the slave, the refugee, the heathen, the immigrant, the eunuch. Although Abedmelech might well have been made someone he did not choose to be, God was not excluding him from salvation or his spiritual house. That is why one of Jeremiah's prophetic predecessors, Isaiah, he wrote concerning 
eunuchs, gave them a, prof, a, a promise. In Isaiah 56, the promise was given to eunuchs. Let no foreigner who has bound himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let not any eunuch complain. I love the language of the King James Version. I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what please me and hold fast to my covenant. To them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. Isaiah said to the eunuchs, "You, while you may not be able to carry your name forward, into posterity because you cannot have children. Fear not, Isaiah said, because your name will be placed in the house of the Lord. And if like a Abedmelech, we put our hope and trust in God, God will write our names there too. You see, God has a place for everybody in his kingdom and in his kingdom business. So like Abedmelech, my challenge to us, let us put all of our hope and our trust in the Lord. Because Abedmelech's life teaches us that God can use anyone at any time for anything in any place. Because God values everybody. Amen.